Okay, so assessment of aortic valve with CT. So I will give a brief background about aortic valve disease and how we assess it on echo for the benefit of, benefit of the radiologists here. And then we will look at the role of CT in aortic valve disease, including TAVI assessment. So we will under, try to understand the anatomy of the aortic valve and root, assessment of aortic valve disease in conventional practice and total role of cardiac CT. So we have four valves, as uh, all of you know, in the heart. And uh, the two main problems they undergo is either they become stenotic or they uh, under, have regurgitation. Valve disease uh, form about up to 20% of all cardiac surgical procedures. In the Western world, we see more of degenerative uh, calcific valve disease compared to rheumatic valve disease. And aortic valve is probably uh, more commoner, aortic valve disease more commoner than mitral valve, but mitral valve prevalence is also high. The main problem we see with aortic valve is stenosis, but regurgitation also occurs. With mitral valve, we see more of degenerative regurgitation. And then we then patients can have tricuspid regurgitation and pulmonary valves, pulmonary valve problems. The main state of diagnosis for uh, valve disease is cl clinical assessment along with echocardiography to start with transthoracic, uh, followed by transesophageal, and we use MRI and CT for uh, the complementary techniques in uh, in for problem solving difficult cases. So that's the aortic valve uh, in, sh in its double sh oblique short axis. And we have seen the normal morphology of the aortic valve as tricuspid. And then we have the three sinuses, as you know, and the origin of the coronary arteries relating to the left and the anterior uh, aortic sinuses. Aortic valve is a semilunar valve. The way the leaflets look like are uh, like half shape, like moon shape, you can say and they are attached, the leaflets are attached to each other at points called commissures. And then you have the free edges of the leaflets and the point where the, the leaflets or the cusps are attached to the wall of the aortic root that is called the uh, annulus, aortic annulus. And they, that contains some fibrous tissue but there is no, there is no anatomical annulus as such. This is a very good article by Professor Anderson, published in Heart some years ago, which is which gives the anatomy of aortic root and aortic valve in quite detail. So, the causes of aortic uh, stenosis most commonly at the level of the valve. And here I'm probably showing that the um, aortic annulus is in continuity with the mitral annulus, forming a figure of eight uh, appearance. Now, when we describe the aortic root, we describe it as three components, as you have been doing it. Uh, so the main uh, component is the aortic sinus with the bulging of the sinuses. And we measure the uh, mid sinus diameter to uh, describe the size of the aortic uh, sinus at mid level. And then we have the aortic endulus. And the third, we have the sinotubular junction. So three different levels we measure the aortic root. The causes of aortic valve stenosis most commonly at the valvular level, which is, as I said, uh, degenerative stenosis, either in a tricuspid valve or in a congenital bicuspid valve. Then rheumatic disease also can cause stenosis of the aortic valve. But rarely we also see subvalvular stenosis as well as supravalvular stenosis through the aortic root. <coughs> so. Some examples of normal tricuspid aortic valve. This is example of a bicuspid degenerative valve. This is a rheumatic um, aortic valve, and this is a degenerative tricuspid valve with stenosis. So bicuspid valve, um, aortic stenosis uh, is, is, you know, forms roughly according to where, so where I've picked this uh, data up is more, more than half of all aortic valve stenosis but commoner in the younger population. So less than 70 years, um, bicuspid aortic valve stenosis is more commoner. Overall, there's uh, higher incidence in men. 20% of patients with bicuspid aortic stenosis present with aortic regurgitation. 
and they are more prone to infective endocarditis as well as aortic uh, dissection. So pathophysiology of aortic stenosis, so as the sev severity of aortic valve obstruction increases, the left ventricular myocardium becomes hypertrophied generally, is increase in the uh, left ventricular pressures and diast diastolic dysfunction, etc. Eventually, the left ventricle may dilate in end more end stage uh, disease and patient would develop pulmonary arterial hypertension. <clears throat> so, clinically, patients present with breathlessness on exertion. Uh, they can develop angina as well, which is similar to angina in obstructive pulmonary artery disease. Some patients can also have syncope, and clinically, uh, we, we find systolic ejection murmur uh, in patients with severe aortic valve stenosis. So, echo is the mainstay of diagnosis of aortic stenosis. So, it describes the morphology of the aortic valve, presence or absence of calcification. And then there are <clears throat> three parameters. Uh, we use an echo to, uh, to uh, evaluate aortic stenosis. So the first is the, the, it is the, uh, the velocity. So we basically stun through the continuous wave Doppler and it is the calculation of peaks. So it should, it should be peak velocity and the mean gradient. Peak velocity and the mean gradient and then calculation of the effective valve area uh, using the continuity valve equation. On TOE, one can also calculate the actual aortic valve area by direct plenimetry. And then echo helps, echo helps in quantification assessment of the left and the right ventricular systolic function and the left ventricular diastolic function and assessment of pulmonary arterial hypertension. So this provides a comprehensive work of a patient with suspected aortic valve disease. So that's just the M mode through the aortic valve, just showing the opening and closing, normal opening and closing of the aortic valve here. And these are some cross-sectional imaging images of a tricuspid thickened calcified aortic valve and bicuspid aortic valve. So those of you who you do echo, you do these things in daily practice. Uh, this is the continuous wave Doppler through the aortic valve on apical four chamber view. This is the this is the flow continuous wave flow through the uh, uh, stenosed aortic valve and here we can see the measurement of the peak velocity 4.8 so which is higher than 4, 4 is severe and calculation of the gradients etc through this valve on this on this particular so this is very important the way uh, one doesn't echo this is the mainstay of diagnosis of severity of the aortic valve stenosis and the and the gradient is calculated by the modified Bernoulli's equation and these are the criteria which uh, are used on echo to grade the varying degree of stenosis based on the peak velocity, mean gradient, and valve area. Okay, and valve area of less than one centimeter square. And I think more and more we are realizing the limitations of effective valve area on echo and using more of the hemodynamic measurements, the peak velocity and mean gradient as more important to signify or represent severe aortic stenosis. <clears throat> so that's just a direct plenimetry on a TOE image. Now, challenge could be that on TOE, that uh, true cross section may be difficult to achieve, and this is where CT angiography comes into play, which I will come to later on. So, calculation of valve area is based on continuity equation, uh, which is basically uh, based on the fact that the flow of blood through the LVOT should be equal to, and this equal blood flow should flow through the aortic valve. And if we know three of the parameters, we can calculate the aortic valve area from, from them. And this is what how um, the aortic valve area is calculated by continuity equation. Some of the sources of calculation of error in calculating effective valve area are well known. And I think the most important one is that calculation of the LVOT area from the diameter from the peristal view is short and that was can cause uh, calculation of smaller valve area on echo based on uh, effective valve area or continuity equation and there are other sources of error also that have been described in literature so now what is the role of CT in assessing aortic valve stenosis. 
So first is that you have seen some examples that CT is very sensitive in detecting calcium generally. So in the valve also we can demonstrate calcification in patients with aortic valve disease. You can see calcium in the wall of the aortic root, aorta, etc. We can assess the morphology of the valve if we give contrast on CT angiography. We can assess the valve area directly, which I'll show you. Then size of the aortic annulus, aortic root, etc., and the whole of the aorta. And also we can look at the uh, thickness of the left ventricular myocardium and assess function. So aortic valve calcification um, has been shown to be directly related to the severity of aortic valve stenosis. So these are some examples of varying degree of aortic valve calcification. And we can quantify the calcification quite easily on the same uh, software which we use to quantify calcium score. <clears throat> so studies have been done looking at the correlation between aortic valve calcification with severity of aortic stenosis on uh, transthoracic echo and on, on, on catheter gradients across the aortic valve. And we can see here these two studies here have shown that uh, uh, calcification of more than 3,700 uh, corresponded to an aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square. While these two studies show a lower uh, degree of calcium score correlating with uh, severe, severe aortic valve stenosis. So that is a bit of discrepancy between these studies here. Now, this one study is quite uh, a good one in 650 patients in which they assessed uh, calcium score in the aortic valve with transthoracic echo mean gradient. And they found that in men, a score of around 2000 had the best um, accuracy, while in women, a score of around 1300 had the best accuracy in terms of a threshold for um, saying that this patient could have severe aortic valve stenosis. And they found a discordance between echo mean gradient and aortic valve area on, uh, in about 30% patients. So let's look at this. So this is um, a validation. Um, they validated these values in a group of around 179 patients. And they found that a score of this much was most accurate, around 1,651. This is, I think, a different study here. Okay, test group and uh, test group and uh, validation group. And I think what they are saying here, no negative predictive value, positive predictive value 97% with a score of 1,651. Okay, so one of the usefulness of calcium score by itself for aortic valve patients is in, is, is, is in patients with heart failure, um, with low, low ejection fraction, low gradient, low, low flow, low flow, low um, gradient ejection fraction. So here we can see this is a um, study from, uh, our, from Harefield Hospital in which we had 181 patients who had undergone with aortic valve stenosis who had undergone CT, um, CT uh, calcium scoring and uh, CT angiography. So these are patients who were, uh, who had CT because of, they were being followed for, uh, for TAVI assessment. And patients were divided into four groups based on their cardiac function and flow. And you can see the patients with low gradient, low flow, and low gradient normal flow, they had lower degree of calcification compared to those with high gradients. So this is one area there where calcium uh, scoring of the valve could be uh, quite useful. Then in prognosis, it's a study of 800 patients published in JAMA a couple of years back on JAK, sorry, published um, in 2014, follow-up of three years, and they showed that the patients with severe calcification have worse prognosis compared to those with lesser degree of calcification. And severe calcification, according to them, was 2,000 in men and 1,200 in women. So, Aortic valve calcification can be used as a surrogate marker for degree of stenosis, particularly in those patients with reduced ejection fraction. It can be used for risk assessment. And when, as radiologists, when we do chest CTs, for example, non-cardiac CTs, then if we pick, it, pick calcification up, and then we can raise suspicion of aortic valve disease, the mark of aortic valve disease. So 
how do we assess aortic valve uh, on CT? So as you have seen, we make a, a, a oblique views through the aortic valve uh, in double oblique plane to get a proper true short axis through the aortic valve and root. And then if you have done the study in retrospective uh, mode, you can assess the valve uh, as a moving um, object. And the morphology of the aortic valve is so clear on CT that you almost never have a doubt. You can sometimes, uh, in very heavily calcified wells, it may not be sure whether it is a true bicuspid or, or uh, a tricuspid valve with fused, uh, two of the cusps being fused, that can be difficult. But otherwise, in majority of cases, the morphology of the valve is quite clear on CT. So, and then one can uh, do direct planimetry of the valve at its, the point of its um, minimum opening and quantify the valve area. So, to perform CT valve planimetry, um, so patients like, for example, those with severe aortic valve stenosis being worked up for TAVI, so we don't give them beta blockers normally, nor we to give them GTN, just scan them. And what we need is at least the systolic phase of cardiac cycle between 0 or 10% to 40%. And uh, we tend to use 120 kVp for these patients because they have huge amount of calcium. So the image quality is not so good if we use lower kVp. And then we reconstruct anywhere between 1 to 2 millimeter contiguous images at 5% interval. One can use 20% also, that also is fine through the, uh, through the whole heart. And then we try to obtain those double oblique short axis view through the uh, tips of the aortic valve in mid systolic phase. So there are a number of studies correlating the uh, aortic valve area on CT by direct planimetry compared with uh, the echo techniques and MRI. And one such study in 48 patients were compared with CT with transesophageal echo MRI. And you can see the mean diameters here with different techniques. And what they found with, with, it, uh, with in this study was that the um, area measured by direct planimetry on CT, MR, and transesophageal echo was similar with no difference. But the effective valve area on transthoracic echo was much smaller. As you can see here, it's two. Yeah. And this is a say, this is, I think this is a different study in which uh, they found similar findings that the CT grading of uh, the CT grading of um, uh, aortic stenosis was less compared to the echocardiographic grading. And different studies have shown the same thing largely that there is the valve area measured on CT is larger compared to that measured from effective valve area on echo. So why is aortic valve area by CT larger compared to effective valve area on echo, transthoracic echo? Is could, the number of reasons for it. So one of them could be that CT is measuring the direct, uh, direct by direct telemetry, the actual anatomical valve area while the effective valve area is the area of the vena contracta. And then the, the valve area with CT, the echo could be less because of the smaller LVOT diameter being measured, not the true LVOT area. So that's, uh, that's a source of error that now is well known. And then again, effective valve area is an average functional area compared to the anatomical area on CT. So all those reasons are there which may be cause, causing discrepancy. So if you look at compare the um, compare the role of echo versus uh, CT in aortic valve. So I think for morphology I would say that CT is much better except TOE is probably equally good in valve area. Valve calcification we, uh, we assess uh, much better on CT. For assessment of hemodynamics, there is no doubt that echo is the gold standard for assessing hemodynamics through the aortic valve. Aortic valve area, I would say, I would if, if you don't do it correctly, the right technique, CT gives a very good value of aortic valve area. For morphology of aortic valve, 
I think uh, CT is, is, is superior. For measuring every size, function, mass, I think both techniques can be good, how you measure them. And for pulmonary hypertension, again, echo is superior. So they are, they are complementary techniques, largely. Okay, then there is, a, there, there is a, 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 you can also pick up aortic valve regurgitation on, on CT. And the way we pick this up, uh, and echo is again the, the primary technique for resistant valve lesions. Uh, this is all an echo. So what we see is on CT, area central point of lack of coaptation of the leaflets, which would represent that there is, um, there is regurgitation through the aortic valves. And I, I see this all the time in cases which have aortic valve regurgitation. Again, you know, you wouldn't do CT just for this. But the reason we are doing all the CT scans for aortic valve nowadays is for TAVI assessment. That's the primary, primary thing. Okay, so uh, there are some, again, few studies done on this subject. I won't go into them. Now, CT is excellent for demonstration of the size of aortic roots. So patients with aortic root dilatation, dilatation in the ascending aorta, dissections, etc. we do CT scans. So mitral valve, I won't go into because the role of CT in mitral valve is still being defined. We are using, we are doing percutaneous mitral valve intervention because without the use of CT currently. It's not being, CT is not being used for this purpose. So now I'll proceed to the talk on TAVI. And that's a talk uh, by Ben. So I'm going to, as he's not here, I'm going to speak, go through this talk. So aortic annulus, we have looked at the, um, the post-mortem image of the uh, aortic valves and what the, what the annulus is. So annulus is the base of the cusps. That's what we are trying to define on imaging for the purpose of the sizing, sizing of the TAVI valves. So one of the common valves is the metronic core valve. So, so you can see this is a self-expendable valve. And it is a position of size of the annulus here that determines the size of this valve. Okay, so at this point, at the uh, base of the leaflets. And the other commonly used valve um, is the Edward Sepkin valve, which is a balloon expendable valve. So again, here also it is the size of this annulus that's the most important thing. And this is an image uh, of a patient who has had the metronic core valve. Okay, so that's the coronal image and the way that uh, we define the aortic annulus and you can see in that uh, movie. So in this plane, we are defining the true plane of the aortic annulus and you know this, you have been doing this on all the scans and you get the true short axis through the uh, aortic valve and then you go down on that and you then come to the annulus level and then you measure the minimum and maximum diameters of the aortic annulus. You can assess the aortic valve area if you have all the phases uh, through the systolic phase of cardiac cycle. <coughs> assess the morphology of the valve. Now this is an um, article, this is an article, I think it's in the folder, which describes how, um, how to uh, go about um, getting the right plane of the aortic annulus. But I will show you how I do it. So if you want, you can uh, look at that article. So one of the things that in, in, at the plane of aortic annulus, what we need is the minimum and maximum diameters of the annulus. And as we know that annulus is not a round structure, it is oval in majority of the patients. Yes, oval structure. So, um, so we measure these diameters, we calculate the mean diameter, then we calculate the perimeter of the annulus and also the software will calculate the area of the annulus for us as well. So it's the mean diameter, it's the, the area and the perimeter, those are the ones that's mainly required for sizing of the TAVI valve. Those are the main things that's required. The other things we measure are, are the um, distance of the coronaries, ost coronary ostia from the uh, base of, from the annulus of both left and right. We measure the size of the mid sinus. 
uh, uh, maximum size of the center tubular junction and also we also measure the angle of the aortic valve plane from the horizontal so i'll show you that on the images later on so there are different sources of measurement that can occur so you know right technique is very important when we measure these um, analysis and you can either overestimate or underestimate the the valve diameters you can go if you if you're not correctly positioning your plane you can be measuring the lvot or you may be measuring the level above the aortic annulus so you can over measure the size so if you if we if we underestimate the size of the annulus what are the risks of that paravalvular leak dislodgement of the embolization of the uh, valve uh, i think paravalvular leak is probably the uh, greatest cause for concern and oversizing rupture rupture, rupture, rupture of the endless probably very rare i suppose but potentially can happen okay and then um, people have also described not just measurement of the mean air mean diameter like this but also diameters based on the area and the perimeter so i don't do this personally but these have been described and have been shown in a couple of studies to be more significant now, other thing that people debate about is which is the best phase in cardiac cycle to assess the size of the aortic root. And the most of the guidelines describe that it should be measured in systolic phase. And systolic phase is on the CT. On the echo, you can see the systolic and diastolic phases easily. It's there. But on CT, we so we the systolic phase starts from 0% of cardiac cycle. So 0% is end diastolic phase. So from that to 40%, which generally is the end systolic phase cycle. So this is a study of 110 patients in which they measured the uh, annular size in all the phases of cardiac cycle. And you can see from here that the, the, the diameters were maximum in the systolic phase. And this particularly this one here, this is the mid systolic phase, which is around 15 to 20 or 10 to 20 percent phase of cardiac cycle. This is where the diameters were maximum, even in severely calcified valves. So when we see valves with severe aortic stenosis, which with a lot of calcium, the calcium is mainly in the leaflets of the aortic valve, not so much in the annulus. So we still see good movement of the aortic annulus in these patients. There may be calcium, they generally where the calc calcification is focal. Uh, in the annulus if it is there maybe in 20 25 percent patients i would see focal calcification in the annulus and sometimes it goes down along the lvot as well but majority of cases the aortic annulus moves so it's a pliable maybe not as much as in a non-calcified valve but it is still moving expanding in the systolic phase of cardiac cycle and maximum diameters you will get is between 10 to 30 percent phase of cardiac cycle so this is showing the same thing basically so if you measure the size of the aortic annulus in other phases you may underestimate the size of aortic annulus and this is comparing with different techniques and this i think this is a good um, diagram here image here showing the measurements that we do mid, mid sinus st junction ascending aorta osteal height etc so question in this image it's a little bit oblique the lvot so it's, it's not completely aligned oh. these are very pictorial aren't they they're not real in the sense they are they're not they're just shown the are you talking about these yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. i know that they are not real but the, the, the way or the place you put the green line ah, I mean, Oh, this green line. Okay, I'll show you. So this is this is an LVOT view. On LVOT view, is similar to your parasternal view on echo. So this anterior cusp you are seeing. This is your anterior leaflet, and what you're seeing posteriorly is the commissure between the non-coronary and the left leaflets. So this is not base base of a cusp. It's commissure. So when we align ourselves, you will see this is this is always the case. So this is correct. This green line is correct. Okay, so correct. So this is the commissure point. 
so you don't want to raise it higher up to the, that level this is how it is it's perfectly aligned okay so and obviously we can assess the uh, whole of thoracic aorta with ct and you don't want to be putting a tevi valve in these patients they need to go for surgery okay so then there are as you know that there are different sizing sizes sizes for the the valves different size valves come rather and t2 has gone gone through these so we used to at hairfield we used to use a core valve before but now we use their new version evolute r and we use the boston lotus valve those are two valves now we are using most most common i think evolute r is a retrievable valve you can retrieve it if you are not happy with the or you can just change the position slightly okay so these sizes are there with all the valves so mechanism of para paravalvular leak with after tevi procedure so undersizing of the valve processes so causing the paravalvular leak or incomplete processes of apposition or under expansion or that's a technical thing now that could occur because of either the the, the annulus is very very eccentric very oval or there is calcium in the annulus so that can prevent expansion of the valve against the annulus or there could be malposition of the valve too high too low and sometimes you know when the this angle of the valve plane is steep from the horizontal the alignment of the valve can be quite difficult and that obviously comes with experience of the international cardiologist as they do more and more procedures they, they become more clever in how they they deploy the valve correctly in patients with steep steep valve angles so calcification in the annulus particularly here as you can see in this case this is what causes uh, one of the causes for paravalvular leak as the valve cannot be expanded fully along the areas of calcification so let's go through this now one of the important cal complications with type procedures is are the vascular complications vascular access complication or complications along the iliac vessels and the aorta so about 15 to 20 percent um, rate of complication has been described including vascular dissection perforation exercise excess site hematoma retroperitoneal bleeding false aneurysms etc okay so when we do the ct scans for these patients we have to cover the heart and the aortic root including the proximal thoracic aorta for the purpose of sizing the aortic root and the annulus then we have to do a second scan for the excess which would should include from subclavian arteries down to the common femoral arteries all the way now there are two ways this is done so with the older scanners even our scanner is new but our scanner the way it does it is we do a gated study so this requires a gated study because you want to study the aortic root in systolic phase of cardiac cycle so you have to gate it and then you require a non-gated study for the access yeah so there are some scanners the newer ones that can do a gated study for this part but in fact they can do a non-gated study followed by a gated study followed by a non-gated study for rest of the aorta in one continuous um, uh, scan with one single contrast dose but that is ideal but if the scanner cannot do that then you have to adapt by doing a gated study for this part and a non-gated study for the whole aorta so that's what we do at the moment so to op to optimize so we can do it with one contrast injection so i uh, we will do a gated study here and same contrast uh, continues for some more time and the scanner goes to scan from the top to the bottom in a non-gated manner with the previous scanner we were doing two contrast injections one for this and one for the whole aorta like that. so you have to adapt your protocol to what the scanner can do in your own center okay so just to conclude that uh, uh, CT has become probably a technique of choice for imaging the aortic root but particularly for heavy uh, valve sizing and for peripheral access okay any questions on this